Bueno, en primer lugar, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Es para mí un honor presentar a Cyrus Mina, quien es un autor eh, de gran relevancia en el pensamiento contemporáneo y que conforme nos vamos acercando a la divisoria trópica del cambio climático, pues vamos entendiendo el tamaño de la importancia de su trabajo en materia de política económica y otros temas. Entonces, uh, thank you very much, Professor, for being here. Thank you. Um, eh, voy a hacer una pequeña introducción del, de su currículum. Eh, el profesor Cyrus Vina es eh, Distinguished Research Professor de Economía en la Universidad de Minnesota, Estados Unidos. Fue invitado académico en el periodo 2002-2003 y posteriormente 2008-2009 en el Centro para Teoría Social e Historia Comparativa en el Instituto de Investigaciones Sociales de la Universidad de California en Los Ángeles, UCLA. Fue el anterior miembro y asociado del Centro de Estudios de Medio Oriente en la Universidad de Harvard de 1990-95. Es un teórico pionero de la globalización del petróleo y la unificación del sector energético, la globalización de la economía mundial y el declive de la Pax Americana y un especialista en Irán moderno y asuntos contemporáneos en Medio Oriente. Autor de libros como The Economics of the Oil Crisis, Oil a Time Machine, A Prelude for the Foundation of Political Economy, Oil War and Global Polity, y coeditor de Modern Capitalism and Islamic Ideology in Iran, Beyond Survival, Wage Labor and the End of the 20th Century, and Alternative Theories of Competition, Challenges to the Orthodoxy. Ha publicado más de 250 artículos académicos, ensayos, capítulos, trabajos de investigación eh, sobre política, entradas en enciclopedias y pronunciado como ponente principal en varios foros internacionales con temáticas sobre petróleo, energía y medio ambiente. Irán, política exterior de Estados Unidos, así como el establecimiento justo de la paz, la globalización y el equilibrio de poder, así como guerra y paz en Medio Oriente. Su trabajo se ha traducido a varios idiomas, incluido el alemán, italiano, japonés, persa y español. Él es miembro de los Economistas por la Paz y Seguridad, editor del Journal of Critical Studies in Business and Society. También es autor de diversas series de ponencias académicas publicadas en YouTube, como las tituladas Advanced Lectures in Contemporary Political Economy, A Century of Petroleum. Eh, y bueno, pues eh, la dinámica será que el profesor Vina nos, eh, nos entrará una charla de alrededor de 40 minutos y después... Eh, Tendremos una, unos comentarios por parte de la doctora Claudia Maya, a quien de una vez voy a presentar, para que ella es investigadora de aquí del CISAN. Nos da muchísimo gusto que esté eh, apoyándonos en ese trabajo. Bueno, creí que estaba aquí tu reseña, que está. Eh, Claudia Maya es doctora en Economía por la UNAM, maestra en Economía por la Facu Universidad de Missouri, Kansas City, y maestra en Finanzas por la Facultad de Contaduría y Administración de la UNAM. Asimismo, es autora de diversos artículos y capítulos de libros en México y en el extranjero. Además, ha participado en distintos coloquios y seminarios nacionales e internacionales. Miembro de la red North American Research Initiative con American University in Washington. Actualmente se desempeña como investigadora del CISAN y profesora de licenciatura y posgrado en la Facultad de Ciencias Políticas y Sociales de la UNAM. Sus líneas de investigación se orientan hacia el estudio de la economía internacional, en particular los cambios en el sistema financiero de América del Norte, financiarización, crisis económicas, moneda y banca, política económica y economía financiera. Entre sus publicaciones más recientes destacan Dólar versus Yuan, competencia por la hegemonía financiera global y eh, crédito, naturaleza, alcances y limitaciones, una perspectiva teórica heterodoxa. Eh, quisiera además aprovechar que eh, decir que estamos muy, muy contentos aquí en el CISAN de poder colaborar con el programa de estudios de Asia y África de, de la UNA. Es, están muy bienvenidas y estamos muy contentos de que podamos establecer esta y otras colaboraciones en el futuro. Muchas gracias por eh, permitirnos participar en este evento. Y bueno, pues sin más preámbulo, el eh, profesor. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Do I, how much do I have? 45 minutes, thank you. Allow me to uh, express my thanks to uh, the center here, as well as the entire university, and particularly to Professor Alicia Duran for uh, taking this uh, as a task and spending about a year or so 
to organize this. I appreciate very much, and uh, it's uh, long overdue on my part to be in Mexico. And uh, thank you again. Uh, this lecture is part of the three series of lectures. And by design, this one is focusing on the so-called Iran deal, the JCPOA, as they call it, technical sense. And I want to really go through the details of it, even though uh, I don't want to get more technical about it, but I want to demonstrate in this particular talk that it has been a very thorough uh, plan altogether, which took nearly two years or so. And it would be nonsense by the President of the United States to say it's not good. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the second lecture, of course, is dealing by design again in a larger focus on the Iran and uh, the United States, U.S.-Iran relations. And I want to demonstrate to you that uh, not only in 1953 coup d'etat, the United States interfered in Iran during the time of uh, Premier Mohammad Mossadegh, who was a Swiss graduate and who was elected by the people of Iran. But the United States interfered in the Iranian revolution. I want to demonstrate that. Normally, when they talk about the Iranian revolution, they speak of uh, the Islamic revolution. I want to demonstrate that this is not so. And uh, we'll come back in the next lecture to demonstrate that. The third lecture, by design again, is to look at the world and the role of the United States in the so-called Pax Americana, post-World War II uh, system of the interstate system of economy, polity, and ideology. And then also demonstrate against some of my leftist colleagues as well that it has been declined a long time ago. And uh, also demonstrate that why the US policy is the way it is, how it is. So let's go back to the first one, focusing on the so-called Iran deal. Uh, I think there are three things in Iran deal that we need to know. One is a very important background of NPT, non treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons altogether, which I have tried to uh, organize on a basis of this uh, PowerPoint to make it a little bit more visual, even though uh, I'm uh, so illiterate in Spanish, uh, to be able to demonstrate it altogether. And so that's the background. N NPT would be very important. The second part of this lecture which is very important and I would like to focus on is to demonstrate that what was the relationship uh, of the United States with uh, Iran uh, in a sense of uh, uh, the nuclear developments and so forth. What was the connection and so on. And the third one, also uh, in the final part, focus on the issue that why this deal is very unusual deal, unusual in a sense that it is so rigorous. And I'm really surprised that Iran said yes. And also would like to indicate to you that some of us, some fellow of Economies for Peace and Security, and we have so many Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates in our organization, and um, some of these, and namely several of us, uh, many people who have been involved in this uh, deal in, in terms of knowing what's going on, really give a favorable view of it, uh, including Kenneth Arrow, Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz, 
and many, you know, uh, uh, Jamie Galbraith and myself. So anyway, so as you can see in the PowerPoint, the NPT was the organization which was started in 68, the talks around uh, between the nations who wanted to really do something about uh, nuclear uh, weapons. And, uh, and of course, given the fact that uh, the first country who used the nuclear weapons on Japan uh, prior to the conclusion of war was the United States, so not, not standing with that. So, and then in 1970, uh, I think uh, in the United Nations, so many countries got together and they wanted to uh, limit, first of all, the uh, development of the nuclear weapons. And second of all, they wanted to have a framework for it. So the countries which are not yet uh, had access to nuclear weapons, they know that it is not to prevent them from the technology. In other words, nobody would sign it if that would have been the case. Uh, technology would be very important. It would be uh, dialectically and uh, organically related to uh, the weapons. And then yet one has to safeguard for the production of weapons. 1970. And uh, of course, uh, in that treaty, if you look at it, uh, uh, on a uh, total of 191 states, including Iran at the time, and the Shah, some of you may not even remember, may not even be born, but you know, the previous to this government signed it, and so is this government still, and joined the treaty. And uh, on May 11, 1995, the treaty was extended indefinitely, in other words, to make sure that uh, the spreading of the nuclear weapons would be controlled. And the treaty uh, also is the cornerstone of the global nuclear non-proliferation regime and foundation to pursue the nuclear, nuclear disarmament altogether under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, as a UN agency altogether to safeguard. In other words, they have this agency as a mission, a mandate to go and check to see whether or not weapons are made or not whether how today these countries are using their technology to be able or uh, for, for the nuclear uh, development and so on. And the treaty, of course, for most cooperation in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. In other words, technology, development technology is no problem in terms of that treaty. Now, if one takes that as a background, one has to also focus on I already indicated in, uh, let's see, okay, Article 5, which is very important. I want to read Article 5 very quickly uh, because it is dealing with the question that uh, uh, countries can develop uh, technology altogether. Uh, one says, nothing in this treaty shall be interpreted as affecting the inalienable rights of all parties to the treaty to develop research, production, and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes without discrimination and in conformity with Article 1 and 2 of this treaty. The second part of that, Article 4, would say, all the parties to the treaty undertake to facilitate and have the right to participate in the fullest possible exchange of equipment, materials, and scientific and technological information for the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Parties to the treaty in a position to do so shall also 
cooperate in contributing alone or together with other states or international organizations to the further development of the applications of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, especially in the territories of non-nuclear weapons states party to the treaty. We do consideration for the needs of the developing area of the world. In other words, these are not those countries who developed already nuclear weapons, but the countries which are in the process of using this technology and developing and discovering this technology. So, now, let's focus on Iran then as a background. Let me change the course. Uh, I want to, I already selected nine points here on this so-called Iran deal to show you how stringent this has been. One, uranium enrichment capacity is controlled as a measure. Perdo is one of the areas that oftentimes you see in CNN and others they are referring to. The State Department talks about it, US State Department. And the ground enrichment plant is dealt with already. Enrich uranium stockpile already measured and calculated and inspected. And continuously after the deal, almost for two years, I tell you that the date of the deal was July 14, 2015. It took about two years to be able to develop it. And of course, it took uh, many, many parties. And it is not a deal between Iran and the United States. It is a deal which is called five plus one, they call it, as they say. It's funny. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it is uh, under the auspices, or it is a multilateral treaty under the auspices of the United Nations with European Union on the one hand, China, Russia, United States, France and UK and Germany all together. It's not the US deal. It's not just one deal with the United States that somebody says that hey, let's just abrogate it all together. I remember distinctly, and of course some of us in Economists for Peace and Security, which we're concerned about, you know, proliferation of the nuclear weapons and so forth. Uh, we are watching this very often. During the Obama administration, actually, uh, that normally uh, they had all kinds of problems with Russia and China and so forth, uh, the UN Security Council uh, approved it unanimously altogether. In other words, after July 14th, uh, 2015, which was signed in Geneva by all these parties altogether, uh, then a uh, few days after that, probably 10 days after that, the United Nations Security Council approved it. You know. So the fourth point here is research development and future enrichment capacity. In other words, it is an, under control of the IAEA altogether. And it's it just a few uh, moments notice IAEA can go unchecked. Uh, five heavy water reactor in Iraq, which is the region in the northern part of Iraq. Inspections through IAEA, obviously. Investigations into the past activity, because the so-called past activity also, this is also, I have to uh, explain that to you in a second. Uh, what's, what's the meaning of that? Because Iran was accused of being, making a bomb, actually. And if some of you uh, remember, I think several years ago, Mr. Netanyahu of Israel, uh, almost like a comic, had a comic uh, picture of the bomb in one of the General Assembly uh, meetings in one September several years ago, was saying that uh, the Iran is just this much 
to making a bomb. And it's, it's, it was funny. I mean, people, <laughs> some of the experts were laughing. Of course, some of the people who have been also in the political science and so forth, on the progressive side and at least on the peace side, were laughing about this. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and of course, the role of sanctions relief. This is the key. In other words, this negotiation has been done in a fundamental sense to be able to eliminate the sanctions against Iran. If the sanctions relief were not there, Iran would not sign it. Nobody with any rationality would sign it. So that was the part and parcel of it. That was intended part of it. And of course, the new UN Security Council resolution to replace area ones. In other words, elimination of or uh, disregarding all these sanctions, which we are, of course, uh, will explain uh, in the next lecture uh, this afternoon to you why uh, piles and piles of sanctions against Iran. And of course, Iran should be blamed as well. I'll talk, talk about it in, in, in that lecture. Uh, at the same time, uh, elimination of those uh, sanctions and then having a new sanction in a sense that in five years, Iran should not buy and sell materials for development of nuclear or any other matter. So, now. Item by item, I did select, and I'm trying to find out whether we can manage time, hopefully, without being boring. So, in, I'm going to go to a few of them for, 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 uh, for the audience here. Uh, uranium enrichment capacity. I'll read that. Reduction of Iran's current capacity of 19,000 gas centrifuges by more than two-thirds to 6,000, somewhat around 6,000, out of which just over 5,000 would be actually enriching uranium. In other words, centrifuges are making the purity of uranium is being considered and so forth, so Iran accepted to be close to 5,000, under 6,000, and it, it is, that's achievement. And these would be the first generation centrifuges based on the technology going back to 1950s. In other words, it's an old technology. It's not a today's technology. It's one of the technical elements. Therefore, they cannot develop it on the basis of today's technology, old technology. In addition, for the first years, 15 years of the deal, Iran would not enrich beyond the level of 3.67% purity. Yes, 15 years. In other words, this purity is good for other purposes, for instance, medical purposes. Because there's a reactor in the University of Tehran, a medical school, you know, to do some work in the medical uh, uh, side of the issue. And low enrichment of the kind of nuclear stations. The one which was on the news all the time said that this is enrichment, platinum, and so on and so forth, further underground. The cavern under a mountain near the city of Qom, one of the cities in the northern part, became known in 2009. Under the agreement, it would be merely utilized for non-military research. Two-thirds of centrifuges in this facility would be removed, and the remainder should not be allowed to enrich uranium. No fossil materials should be allowed at this site. These restrictions would apply for 15 years. At the stringentness of the plan would be seen in this. Enriched uranium stockpile. Iran's stockpile of low enriched uranium would be reduced from its current level of 7,500 7, kilograms to 300 kilograms, a reduction of 96% of 
the reduction would be achieved either by shipping the uranium abroad or by diluting it under the guidance of JCPOA and the IAEA, International Agents. Research, development, and future enrichment capacity. There would be limits on the R&D work Iran could do on advanced centrifuges. In other words, let's say 1950s uh, type of technology so that it could not suddenly upgrade its enrichment capacity after the first 10 years of the agreement and bring it the breakout time down from one year to a few weeks, almost overnight. This is a prevention of that. Iran would be able to test experimental new centrifuges on a small scale according to, the, to a gradual plan. Heavy water reactor in Iraq that normally you hear in CNN and other news, you know, they exaggerate and so on. Iran would remove the reactor core in this location and fill it in with concrete, which they have done. The reactor would be redesigned so that it produces much less plutonium, if any. And all its spent fuel would be shipped out of the country, which they did. Iran would refrain from building a reprocessing plant or even doing research or reprocessing indefinitely and would not build any new heavy water plant for 15 years. IAEA periodic inspections. As I indicated, this is a UN agency which can go and notice, a few moments notice a couple of days' notice to be able to do it. And uh, inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency would be in full access to all Iran's declared nuclear sites at the present and with much more advanced technology than they are using now. Inspectors would be able to visit non-declared sites. This is unprecedented with, under the NPT where they think nuclear work might be going. You know, guesswork also is included. A commission made up of the range of IAEA members would be set up to judge whether the inspectors' access with requests would be followed. Now, this one for two years, for over two years, Iran have been doing, and the IAEA will be certifying it, and the EU will agree with this. Uh, Russia agreed. China agreed. UK agreed. France agreed. All these parties, Germany agreed. And UN agreed with this. And of course, uh, investigation into the past activity, which is a key here. Iran has agreed a roadmap with the IAEA officials by which it would provide access to facilities and people suspected of involvement in the past experimental work. And a uh, warhead design managed by the centralized and covert unit, mostly before 2004. IAEA would have to certify Iranian cooperation with the inquiry before Iran benefits from these sanctions relief. In other words, if they want to create and make uh, missiles, uh, therefore the IAEA is involved in this, and sh there should be agreements and so on. Now, the centerpiece, which we have problems with now, and of course, as you know, on uh, May uh, 2018, of course, uh, when President Trump was elected in uh, 2017, actually in November, uh, act, uh, he had the chance for almost a year and a half to certify that. He did it. But all of a sudden, on uh, May uh, 2018, he said no. Because, because what? Because he said that my base doesn't like it. You know, that's very interesting. My base doesn't like it. 
and many other things. And I'll come back to a couple of more points, but this is very important. That part is done by Iran. And by the way, I'm not a friend of the government of Iran, by the way. You look at the internet and my background, you see that I'm against the government of Iran. I have been against the government, previous government of Iran, against the Shah of Iran altogether. So I'm not interested in this. I, my interest is peace and not having war. Now, the role of sanctions, maybe. As Iran takes the agreed step listed above to reduce the capacity and proliferation risk of its nuclear infrastructure, the US and EU, the European Union and the United States, would provide guarantees. Why the US and EU? Because they, these two entities are part of the sanctions all the time. And I hope that in my third lecture, I demonstrate that why these sanctions are there and why these sanctions are not going to cut the mustard, if you will. Later on, I will talk about that. <laughs> provide Russia guarantees that financial and economic sanctions will be suspended or canceled. The EU would stop its oil embargo and end its banking sanctions, and Iran would be allowed to participate in the swift electronic banking system that is the lifeblood of international finance. U.S. would issue presidential waivers suspending the operation of the U.S. trade and financial sanctions. This is the one that President Trump reneged unilaterally. This is a multilateral uh, entity, an element, and a plan altogether. And then put additional sanctions on the top of the previous sanctions altogether. So here, uh, I would like to uh, look at uh, just, I guess my, I'm closing to, to the time, right? Uh, probably. 10 or 15. 10 or 15, very good, thank you. Now here, uh, if you look at, Sorry. New, new resolutions to replace the earlier ones. The JCPOA merged into a new Security Council resolution intended to replace and supersede six aerial sanction resolutions imposed on Iran over the nuclear program. The resolution has passed before the end of the month, but the agreement did not take effect for 90 days and so forth. In other words, they eliminated all the sanctions which were already, we were talking about, as a result of this signing of this nuclear Between July 15th, July 14th, 2015, and May 2018, what happened was very important. Here, authorization by all Five plus one countries have been done, including the United States during the President Obama. July 14, 2015, provided information to the IAEA for investigation. Right away after signing, the international agency was called to inspect Iranian uh, uh, sites of uh, the nuclear. Uh, development. July 20th, 15, adoption by the UN Security Council. This is extremely important. United States was there, and of course, uh, normally the United States and Russia and China are there, and there are sensitive issues. They don't, they did it. October 18th, 2015, steps for full implementation of the JCPOA. In other words, they have a leeway a few months to be able to implement it in a realistic manner. January 16, 2016. The IAEA certified that Iran has taken the key steps to restrict its nuclear program and has put in place in increased monitoring. So the international agency says yes. And then January 16, 
2016. Again, IEA report on implementation day triggered US, EU, and the UN sanctions relief. At the same time, they tell all these entities that you should follow the other part, which is a sanctions relief. May 8, 2018, Donald Trump's unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA, deliberate restoration of all sanctions and initiating more against Iran. Now, the subtitle of this segment, as you see, uh, it says one flow over the Washington's nest. Some of you who may not have seen the movie, there have been a movie in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. A very good movie. It's a very tragic movie, heartbreaking. Please see it. I try to demonstrate what's going on in Washington. Yeah. It's about a mentally disturbed area and so forth and how they, they d deal with them. Uh, it was a very uh, telling story. Uh, here, of course, in a, in a somewhat uh, tragic way and maybe comic way as well, comedy tragedy, Washington is in the same boat. Excuse me. The absence of originality in bashing the JCPOA on the part of Mr. Trump. Why? Because Netanyahu was doing it in a funny way, and nobody really accepted that in the General Assembly of several years ago. They were laughing at him and so on. But then this is a carbon copy that he did, Trump did from Netanyahu. Paucity of perception, along with much animosity against Iranians by Trump, inner circles and beyond. The sheer racism of this government, not only against Iranians, but against the hemisphere here, as you probably experienced, and many others and so forth, is pretty well known, and we don't have time to go through it, but it's well known. The lack of cohesion on a statecraft, and thus on significance of JCPOA. In other words, the State Department, the US State Department, is working on a skeleton. Most of these people resigned after Mr. Trump came. The Secretary of State is a Fundamental Christian Zionist, as they call it, Zionist Christian. And no specification, no uh, idea about the whole world on the part of the Mr. Pompeo, for instance. And so many of major people in the State Department resigned and re or early retired and so forth. This is, this, this is, uh, open secret, actually, altogether. Poverty of reasoning by the U.S. leadership. In other words, Mr. Trump argues that I want to have a better deal. Almost like some of these small town, you know, insurance sales people. I want to have a small deal, a better deal. The question is this, that this particular uh, agreement has been done meticulously. Experts would say that. Major economists would support that. Political scientists, top international relations people would argue for it. Europeans accept that. <clears throat> United Nations accept that. China accept that, Russia accept that, UK, even though they have the hell of a mess on their hands now, they accept that, France accept that. So what the hell is going on? You know, the question is very important to, for somebody who says that I am for the deal, I'm a deal maker. 
Have you heard that this lightning strikes in one place twice? The lightning strikes twice in one place? Even the school children know that. And also the lack of recognition of today's global polity had long crossed the Rubicon, and thus the United States is no longer a hegemon, which would be the subject of the third lecture. In other words, what Mr. Trump is arguing is that we want to be great again, right? You say great again. It has implications. One implication is that we are not great anymore. But another implication is that, again, going to the 1950s, during the very precarious and very mad days of McCarthyism, 50s in the United States. And with all those elements against women, against all kinds of minorities and so forth, which there was some improvement, God, for God's sake, these days, actually, in the 90s and 2000s, and so on and so forth. Abrogate that. So we want to give it great again. And there is also another sense to it, ironically, that we are not great again. This is a feeling of the populace. This is a feeling you don't need to have PhD to be able to have a feeling. You need only to drive a car through the United States from top to bottom, which I did, and feel it's not the same country that I came to 50 years ago during the Nixon time. The United States is declining because the United States was the hegemon of the post-war system of polity economy an ideology. And this populist, a popular feeling is not too far off altogether. And uh, here, the last one, GCOA is also a critical litmus test for Trump's America First motto. So it's very important to also read between the lines in this case and then relate this issue to other issues which are in a very intertwined manner in economy, in polity, in every ramification of life is taking place within the United States and without the United States in this hemisphere and globally as such. In other words, this issue has multiple implications altogether to be reckoned with. It's not just a technical issue here. It's the issue of testing the wheels and testing the understandings of the individuals who are in charge of the policies in the United States and in other countries which are dealing with the United States and as a whole at the United Nations. Thank you. Le doy la palabra a la doctora Claudia Maya. Gracias a todos esta, por estar con nosotros esta mañana. Este, creo que en vez de tratar de hacer un comentario sobre lo que aquí se ha expuesto, que sería una tontería con un, eh, con un especialista como el que tenemos esta mañana, mejor vamos a intentar hacer más preguntas para profundizar en lo que este, nos ha traído. Creo que esta sesión introductoria nos, um, nos lleva a más cuestionamientos y intentaré, I will, instead of making a comment, I will make some questions in order to go deeper in what you have said. So, why Iran? Why, since this is a very, there are a lot of contradictions inside of Iran, of course, but it is a democracy, kind of, with, um, with a religious leader at the same time. And it had been told us that uh, this is a very oppressive system. But Arabia, or 
uh, Arabia Saudita is even more oppressed. And it, it is allied, or it is an allied of the United States. But what, why Iran is a target in this, in this case? What has, in special, in order to be uh, sanctioned with this deal? Sanction, oh, oh, Sanctions with this, yeah. with this deal. This is the first one. And why uh, Iran has been able to develop uh, this nuclear technology? And is it real that wants to build up a nuclear bomb? I mean, it, it has been the, the information that the news have, de have uh, managed in the um, in, uh, in United States. But as you have said, it does, does, he, does Iran really have the uh, intention to build up a bomb? In case it is, what for? Um, and another important question, I think, is um, what is the what is the biggest fear of American uh, analysts in order um, to approach Iran in this in this sense? What does, what does American fear with the deal? Um, and why another question? Because I have some some answers from the news, but uh, your speech has completely gone in another sense. So I want to listen to your question, to your answers. Why Obama considered this deal very important? Yeah. And a few years after, uh, Donald Trump says it is a completely disaster. Uh, to your first question, uh, rightly so, uh, you mentioned the oppression and oppressive government of Iran. Uh, definitely, uh, I think my second lecture would answer com more completely uh, your concerns. But um, I think um, uh, as somebody, a compatriot who uh, left the country 50 years ago and came here, and uh, we were against both governments, against the Shah and against this government, I would testify to that. But the question is uh, not for the United States to decide about Iran, to decide about Guatemala, to decide about Dominican Republic, to decide about Cuba, to decide about Congo, to decide about all these countries, Chile. The people of Chile should decide about Chile. The people of Iran should decide about the government of Iran. This is their responsibility to do so. They are citizens of those countries. The United States should not decide for Mexico. This is the duty of the citizens of Mexicans to decide for themselves. So in this sense, the question is, the sovereignty, that whether or not you're talking about oppressive governments, sovereignty is so important. And it's recently, it's, it was not taken very uh, seriously at all. And of course, uh, weaponizing uh, so-called democracy, which I'm going to be talking about in third lecture, will, will be elements of it which we'll be explaining further. Uh, I think, generally speaking, Iran, after the revolution in the 80s, wanted to, they had agreements with the United States to have supply of uh, materials for the research and for uh, the medical things in the University of Tehran, you know, nuclear for the medical uh, side of it. The United States said no to this regime. Iranian regime. Of course, the regime was involved in the Iraq war, and of course, the United States sided with Saddam Hussein, and these are all besides the points. So they wanted to do something. They reached for China and other places, said that we need some uranium, we need some, some of these things for the medical and so on and so forth. That's why they engaged to 
find whether or not they can develop some uh, uranium uh, supplies and so on and so forth. Second, Shah of Iran, when he signed the NPT, turned out later on that he wanted also to become a nuclear power. I, I disclosed that in the second lecture. Some people don't know that. But seemingly, this government was not. So far, I know. There are rumors here or there that they wanted to create nuclear power, but not. There was a group of uh, uh, anti-Iranian uh, uh, group called Mujahideen. Uh, not not to be confused with it, Afghanistan. Uh, this group, which were against this government of Iran, were spread their rumors and so forth. And of course, now they are in, in the same lot with the neocons in Washington. I'm not defending the government of Iran. If they get my, their hands on me, you know what would happen. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm against them. But it seems to me that there is no evidence so far that they really rooted for the bomb. The third thing, the fear of the United States. I think the United States fear is not this. This is just excuse. The fear of the US government is the loss of hegemony. Long time ago, as an oil expert, and some of you in this group may know, I spent about all my life, all my adult life on oil, <laughs> energy, and so on. Demonstrated that Iran-Iraq war was not about oil against the social democrats and some of my leftist friends. It was about hegemony. They lost the hegemony. This is one of them. The balance of power has changed. This is a short answer to that. And two more questions, just to close. Do we have time? Uh, the first has to do with the, the last comment you made, like what is the role of China in this uh, loss of hegemony and uh, Iran together? I mean, not as a different yes. part, but what is China has to do with, what China has to do with Iran? Yes. And the loss of hegemony of yes. the United States? Yes. Uh, let me turn the question a bit. I will elaborate it in my third, third lecture, which is the focus of that. But just to, to emphasize what you want to hear quickly. Um, uh, I think when the United States, the balance of power has changed. And when I say balance of power, Balance of power means that it's changed everywhere. It's almost like, I don't know whether there is a physicist, astrophysicist in this room. You know, okay. When they say balance of power has changed, it's changed everywhere, you know? <laughs> Following what physicists are talking about. This is my hobby for 40, 50 years, you know, yeah, read this stuff. So balance of power has changed completely. In the Middle East, so-called Middle East, the, the, word, the phrase Middle East, and I, I like your, your uh, arrangement of the departments here, South Asia, West Asia, this and that, rather than Middle East. Middle East is a phrase which is colonial, they call it colonialism. But just for the sake of argument, allow me to use it. Yeah, so. In the Middle East, balance changed. Balance changed everywhere. This is the fear of the United States, per se, which should not include so many of the good people in the United States. I will use my position to make a comment and a question. Can I? Yes. yes. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much for these reflections and bringing us this important um, um, details about the, the um, the situations of uh, happening now with this uh, attempt. Uh, Donald Trump is uh, affecting 
uh, many countries uh, considered by him like enemies, but also uh, to many countries that are considered allies by United States governments, at least historically. Now, uh, Iran and Mexico, we are uh, linked by this uh, common menace that uh, we have become enemies to the um, US government. And we, we are not talking only about Mexican government, but about Mexican people. And of course, as this is happening is the same because we know that, the, that the, with Iran, the main um, affected actor is a, a Persian population and not the government. And, and so, um, so we are now linked. Second, now we are having this um, uh, electoral confrontation in the United States. So inner politics in the United States are affect, affecting the worldwide US policies. They are now um, in this agreement, and so we can see that this elite from the United States are fighting each other, and they cannot reach an agreement between themselves, and they are um, putting in trouble to everybody, and particularly in this case, Iran and Mexico. We are not able to know who we, who we, we are negotiating with. We are negotiating with someone that is pushing for a very bad um, um, trade agreement, or we are pushing with the people that is pushing not to have this trade agreement. And we do not know who is um, pulling from one side or the other side of the row, and we can see that this can become a major confrontation within the United States. And while this is happening, the United States is affecting allies and enemies, considered by them. I think that the main task of every government is to keep war outside of its own borders. Well, to, have, to find a way, the diplomatic way, to keep peace at all costs within the territory. And now, well, we know that the uh, um, United States hegemony is losing power worldwide, is losing power within the United States, is losing power in North America. And so, as they are scared, they are uh, doing things not very intelligent or not very rational. So the, the question would be, how can we as nations in similar trouble, nations having uh, the main task to keep peace uh, within our borders, nations uh, related to oil and petroleum and gas, uh, how can we keep connected and um, strengthening each other? What do you think about this uh, potential communication to strengthen uh, Iran and Mexican relations? Well, I think uh, you raised lots of very pertinent, important questions. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go pick a few of them to be able to uh, give my opinion. Uh, you mentioned to the notion of allies and enemies are badgered practically by the United States, by this government, by Trump government, if you will, a regime, if you will. Sometimes they use it against others about regime. That regime, actually. Yeah. Um, this is because of the transitory nature of power, which I'm going to be talking about in the third lecture actually. And this is the balance of power has changed altogether. And this is in desperation which is taking place. It's not a thoughtful way of strategizing. That, for instance, trade, as you mentioned, when you put
put tariffs on something against China, and then there are all kinds of multilateral elements are going on. And then one single-mindedly look for bilateral, which is a passé from time immemorial altogether, then everybody else is going to be affected. Everybody in the whole world will be affected. This is a world which is so connected in methodological terms in a dialectical sense, as well as in an organic manner, that you cannot separate it from each other anymore. It becomes smaller, in a sense, because they are more connected. One impact on one will have impact on others. And by the way, there isn't any physicist, theorist. One impact in one part of the universe would be another impact on others. This is a similar unified <laughs> mm -hmm. elements that you can imagine. In this sense, the United States is struggling. Even Obama, which I voted for, by the way, struggled with altogether. That relying on the allies, which are now become dinosaurs, would not be. But then, because of the transitory nature, of this process. This is what it is. Now, focusing on Mexico and Iran, as you mentioned. Iran and Mexico used to be similar in terms of a long, long time ago when we did uh, the study of economic development in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Very similar, very, 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 very similar. And of course, the temper, Iranian temper and the Mexican temper is similar, even though we don't have fajitas and margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, altogether, I think the best <coughs> thing is to be able to uh, help with uh, multilateral treaties altogether. One of them is JCPOA. Another one is to be able to have a connection with the entire Latin America as a package. In other words, North America, uh, Iran, and other stuff. In other words, one can connect with other parts of the world. Uh, I know that the difficulty of the belligerent and uh, undemocratic government of Iran is, is the problem. There's no question about it. But one has to also establish people-to-people -people organizations, organization of people-to-people, -people, NGOs and so forth and so forth, would be very helpful altogether. Iranians, as far as I know, they are open to that. Iranians, as far as I know, at least my family, they love Mexicans. <laughs> so in that sense, it would be very important, people-to-people altogether, bypassing the government. But again, the undemocratic government of Iran, which is, of course, the, this is the task of Iranians to take care of, should be recognized. And then, of course, the will of the Iranian people should be very important in that case. But then the people to people should be related. And then, so are the United States as well. There are lots of good yes. people in the United States. A whole chunk of the United States are against this tyranny altogether. The big chunk altogether should be connected. And I think United States people, U.S. Americans love Mexicans and vice versa altogether, as you know. Thank you. Alguna pregunta del público? Adelante. Good morning. Uh, I have two questions. First one is, how much does the presence of states like North Korea, India, and Pakistan, which all of these possess nuclear, nuclear weapons, weaken or uh, vulnerate the NPT? And also, how do we know that the sanctions affect not only the political regime of Iran, but also the population? Uh, we are talking about uh, these sanctions that are called intelligent sanctions or is like indiscriminate sanctions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think these are very 
excellent questions. Uh, I forgot to mention one thing which you're reminding me, that I said 191 countries are member of NPT. There are three, only three countries, or states if you will, that are not refused to sign. And all these three countries developed nuclear weapons, you know, under our nose, all together. One is India. Another one is Pakistan. And the third one is Israel. And this is very interesting, ironic, that Netanyahu had the gall come to the United Nations and talk about Iran. And for no North Korea, still is a member. And I'm really happy that they are a member. As a member of Economists for Peace and Security, we are, we are worried about the peace and, and war. Yes. Now, about the sanctions. All these sanctions, generally speaking, are against the majority of the population and the poorest of the poor in Iran. Remember, Cuba, sanctions against Cuba. And long live the people of Cuba at this time, by the way. They endured it, the poorest of the poor, altogether. The people who have something, in other words, the people uh, or the groups or the elite who have access to those things are not hurt as, as such compared with the poor. And that, of course, is the policy and written policy, if, if I may, of the United States to make them so miserable to beat the hell out of themselves, as they say. I'm, I'm speaking their language, you know, in, a, in an ordinary language, like, like a professor. So that's my opinion. Um, I would like to know precisely which are the companies, the oil companies that are working in Iran. Are they American companies or they are Iran companies? And the uh, relation with this, uh, the seven, I remember very well during 1973, 1974, the Yom Kippur War, that it, it increased the oil production and also the prices. So um, I would like to know which is the, what are they, how they are playing in this game, in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, fighting, and, and if they are spoiled by the USA or they are American companies. I would like to know because maybe that will explain more what's, what's happening, what's behind the, the picture, no? Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, if you let me, I can talk six, six hours from now. Oil is my forte, as you know. <laughs> no, OK, I'm just kidding. Um, to touch base with, with your argument and uh, to respond, 1973-74 uh, was the oil crisis. We changed the framework of oil pricing around the world. Globalization of oil is from that time and decartelization of oil. The International Petroleum Cartel, which was formed in 1928 and then uh, was folded in 1972, and this is a long story, uh, was uh, prior to this crisis. In other words, crisis was about decartelization altogether. And the war that you said, 1973 war, was incidental. There's no cause whatsoever I spent about all my life, 50 years, adult life, to that, to demonstrate that the cause was globalization and transformation, decartelization. What was also uh, what they call it, the incident, which was connected to it, which was happened between the Israelis and Arabs at the time. 
in October war we are talking about. Now, there is no American company, oil company, which does things on, in, in Iran, no. Mostly the companies were total, French, South Korean, Chinese, Russian, uh, probably Italian, used to be Italian sometimes, not Americans. And when we say Americans, because of globalization, I have a different take on this. When you talk about American capital, if you really go there, or German capital, or Japanese capital or companies. These are the forms. These are not the essences anymore. The whole world is transnationalized. That doesn't mean that in one instance, some company may do some favors to the flag, if you will. But in the final analysis, it would not work that way. So that's, that's my take on that in terms of the mm -hmm. oil and Iran. Yes, go ahead. What's behind? Oh, what's behind? The behind was uh, that decartelization of oil had impact. Decartelization means what? It means that they were seven sisters. I'm sorry, seven brothers, if you will, <laughs> because this is a bad sisters. So I'm just trying to project it on women. I apologize. Uh, so anyway, uh, so-called seven sisters. And uh, these are majority of them Dutch and Western and, and Americans altogether. The picture has changed. If you look at uh, the war with Saddam Hussein, if you will, uh, when they restored the, the oil, the same companies that Saddam Hussein dealt with, they were not some Americans, Russians, Chinese, Italians, French, the same, say the same after the war, after the invasion, and so on. That's the test of the globalization of oil altogether. So that doesn't mean that in one instance or two, certain companies would not get their way. I want to abuse of my position again. Uh, now we are, we are talking about what is behind, and Seven Sisters have uh, aroused. So uh, what do you think about the, the financial actors, so uh, JP Morgan, do you think something related on? Yes, in the same way, uh, I think if one wants to really theoretically address that, capital as we know it is not a thing. It's a social relation, if you will. But it would show itself in things. <laughs> OK. So capital as we know it in the sense of business people, if they say, either is in the production process, product productive, or it's as a commodity, it could be moved back and forth, or it's in money form. Okay. And in this sense, when we say transnationalized, or globalized, if you will, capital, the different, these three forms, major forms of capital, are being transformed to each other to be able to engage in accumulation. In other words, if they are not transformed from one form to another form, there is no accumulation. Okay? So in that sense, when we say capital, we talk about three forms of capital, including finance, and of course banks and transnational banks and so forth. So as you can see, the financial crisis of 27, 28, 29, if you look at it, you'll see that the transnationalization of finance altogether and financial services altogether. In other words, banking system, insurance companies, everything else, deregulation of that, unifying it altogether, and then dicing and you know, cutting it up and then sending all these things, all those things that you know better than I do, 
Therefore, uh, the, this is the essence of transnationalization of finance altogether as well. And of course, uh, all these institutions are carrying that burden, if you will, that sign, if you will. And then the crisis, therefore, was global. In other words, not global in the sense that, OK, this is in the United States. I'll wait a minute, maybe six months, maybe one year, maybe it goes someplace else. It's almost like you are just you know, have, striking a match, and all the fire goes quickly as possible to Ireland, to Delhi, to Europe, any part of Europe to India, to everywhere, altogether, quickly as possible. That is a sign of globalization, also transnational. Back to Dr. Ali's question. Uh, so how Iranian oil policy interferes with uh, current American oil policy? Okay. I think Americans don't have any oil policy. I tell you, this, this, this is funny that you raised it. This is great, great, thank you. Americans used to say a long time ago that we are in cahoots with Saudi Arabia, a regime which belongs to three medieval years. Genghis Khan looked like Jesus Christ compared with this video. So, sorry. So, in that sense, Codes with Saudi Arabia is because of oil. And of course, we, I demonstrated that. I'll probably be the only one for the last 40 years or so demonstrated that it's not because of oil and so forth, because of globalization. Now the United States is shifting to become self-sufficient, quote unquote. You ask some of these people who are up to here in capitalism, they don't talk about self-sufficiency of McDonald's hamburgers. They don't talk about self-sufficiency of uh, meat. They don't, you, nobody talks about self-sufficiency of vodka, right? But they talk about self-sufficiency of oil. And they engage in fracking, they call it fracking. The United States. And they destroy the environment in the United States. It just brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. And because of lack of regulations and everything else altogether, they can do it. And if you put the regulation on it, this is so costly, you can't do it. So in that sense, they're called self-sufficient. Long time ago, several years ago, then the question of Ukraine came with Russia. The United States said, some of the people in the United States in, in the uh, elite uh, part of the United States said that, Let's, uh, we, are, we are self sufficient. Let's send oil to Ukraine so Russia is, is not going uh, to be useful, if you will. That's BS, I'm sorry. So, so that's the case. So, in this sense altogether, that's the United States situation with oil, that they use it. Now, Iran. Iran is somewhat dependent on oil. Even though the country is developed so much, oil is still is important, big part of the government budget. And then, of course, oil is a part parcel of other developments, uh, other com companies and you know, process, you know, input to others and so on and so forth. So in that sense, the oil policy is to be able to uh, sell it to the highest bidder, globalization. In other words, they may not be able to spell globalization, but they know it. So. You said globalization. Everybody thinks, well, not everybody, but thinks that the globalization is disappearing since by reading our, since, um, Donald Trump is putting some, to the trade some barriers. So I, I perfectly agree with you. Globalization is in his maximum expression. But uh, why? I think you raised another question, which is so interesting. The question of tariffs. 
and how uh, Mr. Trump is doing. Yes. Uh, you may imagine globalization as sun is moving on, uh, you know, the earth is moving around the sun. The objective process. So we have winter, we have summer, and so on and so forth. But then somebody on Earth is moving and balancing and, you know, like Trump. is doing all kinds of things and uh, uh, that sort of thing. This is possible that momentary, in a momentary manner, to create havoc with the system. Like he, he did with China, with Europe, with Mexico, with uh, Canada, and look at this a uh, trade uh, agreement that these three countries had together, North America. It changed the name. I mean, read the whole thing. They changed a little bit that it's itsy bitsy of this and itsy bitsy of that. Because Mr. Trump wants. He's a mama's boy. He wants. He wants that. So that's why. This is almost the same treaty. So, so that's the case. In other words, you can, by reaction to this globalization, Trump is doing it. This is the reaction to actual thing, in my judgment, that Trump is doing. And then it backfires. Or as CIA would say, it's, uh, what do you call it? It's. They, they, they don't call it backfire. They say, they, they, they have a good word for it. Anyway, similar to that. Backfires. So in that sense, the United States is going against the grain. Long time ago, I wrote, I think in one piece, I'm not sure if it's in, in my recent book or not. I said, the United States is like a passenger which is riding on a train which is departing from the station. And then very much wants to go back to that station. And that's why this passenger is just moving and kind of back in these cars to be able to reach that station. But the train is gone, bullet train is gone. That's the United States. Dagoberto? Professor, uh, I think maybe my, my answer could have a, excuse me, my question could have an answer obvious, but I think what uh, the recent election in Israel and the investigation about the corruption of Netanyahu government yes. could affect in the position of the Netanyahu against the White House and in the same time the, the position of the United States against Iran? Uh, that's a question, right? I think uh, whatever happens in Israel, whether this candidate or Netanyahu, doesn't make any difference in a fundamental sense, in my judgment. The only difference is for Mr. Trump, whose friend was not elected completely Netanyahu, and who have fam almost like a family relationship altogether. Because he carbon copies on the GCPOA, I demonstrated that, carbon copy thing. Um, but then at the same time, uh, in the United States, they are making big deal of Israel, what's going on in Israel. I, I don't want I want I don't want I want to be a little bit diplomatic in this. Okay? I know what comes. Okay. Uh, 
Okay? Doesn't matter. It's real. Doesn't matter. Yeah. ¿Alguna pregunta? I think it's not the lack of the globalization, like the chair Claudia says, but also the crisis of the multilateralism uh, that changed uh, the international dynamic, also the lack of a unique hegemon state, like you mentioned, and a proliferation for a variety of factors, uh, not only other states like Russia or China, but also the transnational value chains or um, <clears throat> other actors, the atypic actors that uh, uh, are entering toward the, the international dynamic. Uh, also, I think the Iran um, pos position is strategic but also, uh, for the presence of atypic um, <clears throat> groups like terrorists, terrorism that is uh, like, I think that is like the most threat that uh, of United States thinks for the proliferation of nuclear weapons that also implicates that that the terrorism could uh, replic or I don't know how to say uh, possess a nuclear weapon for the illegate uh, yes <laughs> yeah I think uh, well uh, I've seen uh, so many movies about these things <laughs> and then um, I don't know whether you have seen it. I, I did not recall in late 1990s, there was a series called uh, Nikita. Uh, well, for some reason, I like that. But anyway. For some reason. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, position of that. That's a serious question. But. Uh, this question can also be used or abused against nation states. So that's that's another thing, I think. Which, of course, uh, as as a fellow of Economist for Peace and Security, we have, we have to be concerned about. Actually, uh, in terms of globalization, when you mentioned globalization, is a structure. It's not a policy. Liberalism or liberal things are policies. You can, you can do things. It's a strategy. Globalization is structure. The earth is moving around the sun. That's the structure. So in that sense, I'm, I'm against all my very good leftist friends, including Marxists, who argue that. I am totally against the argument that they say. This is structure. And this is the era of globalization that we enter to. Of course, my third lecture would start with this, and I demonstrate that by the late 70s, we are done. We are moving to that. Thing. And as such, then, when we say country like China going up because of the grace of Globalization, and of course the internal, you know, uh, tenacity of the Chinese people. I don't want to discount that. So, so that's the case. In other words, you have elements and you have the structure. There's a connection between agency and the structure. We have to do it. So, highly so. Thank you. Alguna pregunta más? Um, well, then we are very grateful, Professor, that you have come here to deliver this uh, reflection with with such clarity and and reminding us uh, the key aspects of uh, understanding our contemporary world and and using this case. Um, as a good example to uh, enlighten uh, the important issues you bring here in this table we, in CISAN, and we are very grateful. We are very grateful to Program and Universitario de Asia y Africa for bringing us this wonderful conversation to CISAN. And 
And well, um, I will deliver the microphone to Claudia so she can give us the timetable. Yes. Muy bien. Este, continuamos a la una de la tarde. Es la segunda parte de esta conferencia. Bueno, esta serie de conferencias eh, aquí mismo y tendremos nuevamente al doctor Cyrus Vina, a la doctora Eugenia Correa y al, Robert, al doctor Roberto Cepeda en la siguiente mesa. Entonces, pues tenemos un poquito más de tiempo. Tomemos un cafecito, pero a la una en punto reiniciamos con, con estas mesas, con esta serie de conferencias. Gracias. Gracias, doctor. Thank you. Let me, let me, let me, let me thank you very much all the staff and all the students and the faculty and the good colleagues here. I appreciate very much. It's a great opportunity for me to be here. I'm proud to be here. And uh, by the way, let me say this. This is Monday, right? 30th of September. I'm proud to be a Mexican for one day. <laughs> 